the topic of my talk was going to be biomechanics of spine, um, but Dr. Cheng did such a wonderful job with that that uh, I, I think that it, it, it should not be that. And I'm going to focus on instrumentation selection uh, and some of the basic biomechanics that goes with it. So um, basically, can you, yeah, so uh, we're going to launch straight after a little bit into implant considerations and mechanisms of failure and then some tips for success, which is always good. So everybody's aware of the purpose of the spine. It protects the neural elements. It stable, stabilizes our external limbs. It supports our body weight. And it's also a great mechanism for locomotion and providing stability for the body to do that. Basically, uh, the purpose of instrumentation is to stabilize uh, either a single segment or globally uh, the spine for treatment of many conditions that we're all familiar with uh, every day when we treat, treat these conditions in the operating room. But as Dr. Chapman mentioned, really the, the, the purpose of instrumentation is to stabilize the segment of motion that we want to eliminate until biological fusion uh, is achieved. And when that's done, uh, instrumentation's goal is achieved. And in, in many cases, for example, in children, the instrumentation is then moot and can even be removed. So what is the ideal instrumentation? Well, it has to do many things, but amongst the many things that it does is that it has to restore our normal alignment. It has to be strong enough. It's got to be inserted easily. It can't fail. It's got to allow us to correct the alignment of the spine in multiple different planes. And it's got to be small enough to allow a generous area for this biological fusion to occur. And of course, uh, ever so increasingly in our modern day, it has to be cost effective. Otherwise, we will lose access to it. So uh, Dr. Cheng really kind of went through this. Uh, I'm just going to uh, slow it down for, for myself because uh, this is something that I need to understand about eight times before it really sinks in. But basically, the, the spine is, a uh, spinal construct is a cantilever. And the spine itself can be considered in the same way. And it's subject to a couple of important forces that I just kind of wanted to spell out and make sure that we're clear on. So we, we have, if you like, uh, in a typical construct, these longitudinal members that are the rods. Uh, and these anchors, which are either screws or they could be sublaminar wires and, and so on. But the, base, the basics of it is that there's an increasingly sized axial loading force or applied load that is transmitted from the cervical region down to lumbar. And it's resisted by this sheer force of the vertebrae uh, and the ligaments and the soft tissues. And when there's a balance, Newton's law says that uh, when they're equal and opposite to each other, other, this is a stable construct, and there isn't motion here. Now, uh, the, there is a, a force at the, at the junction, particularly when there's an imbalance between these. A force is created around that axis of rotation, and that's known as a bending moment. So the bending moment is, if you like, a, uh, a force of cantilever which is centered around the instantaneous axis of rotation. And it's particularly critical for spine instrumentation to understand it and to understand where the instantaneous axis of rotation is. So, so this is kind of, if you like, the basics of it. There's a fulcrum, there's a head and a screw, and there's a moment around that rotation around the fulcrum. And we know that deformity begets deformity because as an increased load is applied, this moment is created. Uh, it, it's, it's a case of uh, the moment is increased by force and distance. So as you have a little bit more uh, kyphosis, the force increases. That causes more of a moment, which leads to more kyphosis and so on. So what does all this mean? Well, we've kind of been through it already, but it means that the instrumentation and bone is subject to deformation as stress is applied. And this is kind of the all-important uh, a graph that, that, that we talked about before, the, the elastic modulus or the stiffness of a construct is that relationship between stress and strain as actually the ratio of this curve. And Dr. 
Shane mentioned out, the strength or energy uh, is the area under the curve there. So for example, in a 21-year-old male, uh, their bones are particularly stiff and resistant to stress. Whereas in an 80-year-old female osteoporotic patient, it's much more subject to failure. So when we look at things such as our own bone, we find that the, this elastic modulus or kind of measure of, of stiffness is low compared to all of these implants that we put in from titanium all the way to cobalt chrome. And so when we select our implant or screw rod instrumentation, we need to be judicious about selecting whatever it is that matches the intrinsic nature of the bone in, in the patient that we have, whether it be osteoporosis or strength from a trauma. So what are, what are the implants that we put in? Well, I mean, th these are kind of relatively straightforward concepts. It has to be non-toxic and strong enough to, to wear resistance, and it has to be inexpensive. So uh, amongst the ones that we use, uh, we use stainless steel, we do titanium, uh, often that's the most common one, and cobalt chrome. Uh, when it comes to other implants, we have a range of options such as polymers and ceramics. So steel was the original, uh, if, if you like, instrumentation construct. Uh, it, was, it had the advantage of being very strong. It was ductile, which meant that it was able to resist transformation to a large amount before it failed, very biocompatible, very cheap, but caused huge artifact on imaging. And that's a big issue with, with what uh, today's kind of expectations are. Titanium alloy came along. And remember that titanium alloy is not just made up of titanium, but actually a significant amount of vanadium. And toxicity from titanium alloy actually relates to the vanadium component. But it had all of the things that, that steel didn't. Uh, it had this lower Young's modulus, and it was compatible. But it wasn't necessarily uh, stiff enough to, to uh, prevent this thing called notch, notching or stress rises being a, a created in the titanium, which later through wear would lead to potential fracture. And we'll touch on that. Cobalt chrome kind of challenged that by becoming much more stiff. The problem is that that rigidity led to uh, failure often at the bone screw interface in conditions such as osteoporosis. And then there are other things like nadolol and peak. So with a screw, there are many different kind of aspects to it. I think what I wanted to kind of uh, emphasize was the fact that there is a difference uh, when it comes to inner and outer diameter. This is what we're talking about with respect to rod. When you have a chance, always select a pre-bent rod to avoid that uh, notching particulate in titanium because it leads to a stress riser. And there are other implants as well to consider here, uh, in addition to screws such as sublaminar wires uh, that may share the load, particularly at the apex of something like a kyphotic uh, deformity. Uh, it's particularly useful as a supplement to the rod screw construct, but it may also cut bone too. And so the alternative of the tape came along for broader surface area. So inner bodies, uh, peak is the most popular one, uh, great load bearing, manipulated easily. Uh, it works really well with allograft. The issue is that it will never ever integrate with bone. You can coat it with titanium uh, and it may help a little bit, but, but that is something that you must consider. Titanium itself can be an inner body. Uh, it's readily osseointegrative. Uh, it will fuse, particularly when there's a roughing of the surfaces to the level of uh, nanotechnology, 10 to the minus 9. It's particularly osseointegrative. And then there are other alternatives as well. So a couple of kind of final points here. Um, basically, um, the strength and the pullout. The strength of a screw is related to the inner diameter. The larger the inner diameter, the stronger the screw. Pullout is related to the sheer strength of the material that you're putting it in, such as bone. And we talked about that with, with stress, stress and strain. The, the major factor here is the difference between the inner and the outer diameter. So the greater surface area that you have between an inner and an outer diameter aspect of the screw, the better the resistance to pull out. And, and the pitch being the uh, distance between the threads, the greater the increase in pitch, uh, 
the better the pull out. The length is actually a negative or inverse factor. So how do we fail? We pull out like we've talked about. Fracture typically occurs when there's a mismatch between the axial loading force and the resistive uh, stress of the screw itself. And then the concept of cantilever bending. Remember what we talked about in terms of, of moments. Well, the same goes for the instrumentation versus the spine itself. And so when there's increased load applied to the instrumentation compared to the axis of rotation of where the spine is, you can have failure, either for pullout or windshield wiping and so on. So it's an important concept. The pedicle is the best area to insert instrumentation because it most closely and better prevents that from occurring. So finally, what are the tips? Put in the largest diameter screw that you can. Uh, and if, if you need to examine the preoperative radiology of your patient, do it. Uh, if it'll take a 7.5 or an 8.5 screw, place that in. Consider these cortical screws, which have greater pitch. Uh, they're typically shorter. They're directed from this uh, medial to, to lateral angle. But they're particularly strong because they, they capture the cortical part of the vertebrae uh, and, and, and the most trabeculated part, which is the pedicle. There really isn't that much benefit in going more than about 50 to 60% of, of the vertebrae in terms of AP. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you go too long, you know, with parallax, you could be doing bad things, particularly in the thoracic spine where the big red lives. And also, change the angle. Do aim for triangulation as opposed to straight in. There, there is definite advantage from angulation of the, of the screws compared to uh, straight in. Tapping is, is, is a concept that, that everybody uh, has kind of ver varying um, practice patterns to. Uh, we, we talked about uh, tapping is creating that kind of a pathway for a larger diameter screw to go in more easily or a cortical screw to go in more easily. The problem is it takes away a little bit of bone in doing so. So for example, particularly with a cortical screw we, or, or a regular screw, we under tap by a millimeter. And then don't forget that you can always augment with cement uh, as well for additional strength in terms of purchase. So in conclusion, uh, the way you achieve uh, good constructs and prevent failure is if you understand the biomechanics of the spine you're dealing with, uh, you match your instrumentation to the particular conditions of the patient that you have, whether it be bone density or other things, and you also don't create malalignment, as we heard from Charlie's talk. You, you, uh, you, you perform all the techniques that you know to prevent malalignment and to achieve alignment. And your outcome's best if you've got the right patient, you perform the right surgical strategy, and uh, you, you've maximized your uh, experience uh, in achieving all of this. Thank you so much. That was uh, really good, uh, uh, Anuj. Uh, I, I, um, I'm always very interested in some of the biomaterials that uh, presentation that you, you give us. I wanted to um, ask a quick question about uh, your use of cobalt chrome rods, if at all. Um, when, when do you typically use it? And, and um, are, if reflecting back on stress shielding from Dr. Chang, do you ever, do you ever, uh, do you ever use multiple rods in your? In your yeah, thank, thanks, Kojo. So it sounds, it sounds like, a, like a setup. We, I, I promised you I didn't ask you that question before, but um, you know, increasingly less so with the cobalt chrome because you know, our, our population of patients typically that present with us have bone density issues. And I, I really think it's, it's, a, it's a failure between the strength of the bone, bone density, and the stiffness of the rod. So in a trauma patient, particularly in a young patient, I would employ it. Uh, I'd consider it. Um, maybe in one uh, percutaneous kind of approaches, I've, I've considered it, but a smaller diameter. Uh, and uh, with respect to multi uh, kind of constructs, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, you know, it's a race between the instrumentation, uh, stabilizing the segment and biological fusion, right? So uh, if I don't achieve arthrodesis in a, in a timely pattern, it's going to fail and it's going to lead to stress riser, particularly when I've notched the rod. So ironically for me, I've gone from two rod constructs, particularly in deformity, to three and now four, just because I've seen so many rod fractures from that all-important L4 to S1 kind of segment. 
it definitely, Dr. Cheng's point was a good point about stress shielding. So it's something that tempers our enthusiasm, uh, but that's where I'm at. So, yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.